Thank you. Um, seeing no more questions for the dais, let me just ask one final question, and it should be fairly short. Uh, just thinking about the economy, you had talked about uh, freight hubs, distribution, uh, the ports, and I know working with my local air district, and I'm sure my colleagues as well, the air districts over, I know since the last 10 years that I've worked with them, have always focused a lot on stationary sources. Now it seems like the air being everyone's moving towards <coughs> mobile sources. Um, as we know, a lot of emissions are from mobile sources. And we've talked about like the clean vehicle rebate program and some of the others. But when you're talking about the the freight hubs and the distribution centers, are we also looking at the, you also mentioned Caltrans does things for mobility. Are we looking at mobile sources? Or are we looking at stationary sources? Um, so the short answer is, is absolutely. The Air Resources Board is all about mobile sources. The way that uh, environmental management is, is the structure is, the, the easiest way to explain it is we split uh, with the local air districts where local entities have control over stationary sources. Okay. We at the state level have control over mobile sources. And frankly, you know, it's, it's what the Air Board has been doing for 50 years. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions for members on the dais? Hearing and seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Maybe stick around for a little bit sure. in case some other questions arise. I'd be happy to. But let me go ahead and just bring up the second panel. I know uh, we spent a good amount of time on this first panel. All right. So if we could bring up our second panel, state and local program providers, uh, Mr. Jason Wimbley, Chief Deputy Director, California Department of C Community Services and Development, uh, Mr. Randall Winston, Executive Director with California Strategic Growth Council, and uh, Ms. Valerie Torella, Manager with State Government Relations at Pacific Gas and Electric. All right. Well, unless you guys have a specific order you want to start in. Okay. Well, I'll go first. Um, Chairman Salas, Assemblymember Stone, members of the committee, Thank you for the opportunity to brief you today on the Department of Community Services and Development's contribution to the state's efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Again, I'm Jason Wimbley, Chief Deputy Director of the Department of Community Services and Development, and my briefing will include an overview of CSD's uh, Low Income Weatherization Program, of, um, co uh, commonly referred to as the LIWP or LIWIP program serving as the department's climate investment program for low-income households in disadvantaged communities. Uh, um, some background on the department. Uh, for 30 years, CST has administered federal energy assistance and weatherization programs, such as the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Low-Income Home Energy Assistance Program and the U.S. Department of Energy's Weatherization Assistance Program. Among other services, these programs help low-income families manage their energy expenditures mm -hmm. by providing energy efficiency and health and safety improvements to residential housing owned or occupied by low-income families. In addition, CSD previously managed a pilot program that leveraged federal funds and utility rebates to install solo photovoltaic systems for over 1,000 low-income households at no cost to the homeowners. Um, fiscal years 2014-15 and 2015-16, CSD received a total of $145 million from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund to support the expansion of existing low-income weatherization and the establishment of new renewable energy programs. Using these funds, CSD established the Low-Income Weatherization Program, again, providing energy efficiency and renewable energy treatments on low-income residential housing located within disadvantaged community areas. LIWIP exclusively targets low-income residential housing in the disadvantaged community areas. LIWIP is designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by increasing the energy efficiency of low-income households through the installation of energy efficiency measures and solar renewable energy systems, and in the process reduce the financial energy burden of um, low-income families. These solar systems are, and energy efficiency measures are installed at no cost to the low-income households that qualify. So there are basically three components to the LIWIP program. 
The first component is um, the single family weatherization that funds the installation of cost effective energy efficiency measures such as improved insulation, energy efficient appliances, lighting, weather stripping, and other measures in single family housing that's owned or occupied by uh, eligible low income households. The second component is a, the solar photovoltaic program that provides rooftop solar photovoltaic systems bringing the benefits of solar power to households that otherwise would be priced out of the benefits of renewable energy. And the third program is our large multifamily energy efficiency and renewables that provides energy efficiency upgrades and renewable energy systems like solar PV and solar water heating systems to large, to large low income multifamily buildings located in disadvantaged communities. To provide these services, CSD relies on a network of nonprofit local providers that have a long history of providing energy services to low income communities. We also have partnered with two statewide nonprofit organizations to provide rooftop solar PV systems and manage the large multifamily component of LIWIP. Uh, CSD designed the program, the LIWIP program, that is, with input from stakeholders, including the SB 535 coalition, and will continue to make program adjustments to the program based on feedback of our partners and stakeholders and experiences from uh, initial program implementation. The program is also designed to leverage multiple funding sources to optimize greenhouse gas returns and service benefits to disadvantaged communities from state uh, greenhouse gas reduction fund investments. This includes leveraging the low income home energy assistance program funding that supports the inclusion of non energy benefits like health and safety improvements, as well as utility rebates from the California solar initiatives. Um, also this known as the SASH program, the single family affordable solar homes program to reduce the overall cost of solar projects, allowing us to uh, provide solar to more low income families. The benefits of LIWIP provide provides to low income households and disadvantaged communities are multifold or manifold. By increasing the energy efficiency of these households, whether through weatherization or solar systems, LIWIP produces greenhouse gas emissions. These energy efficiency and solar improvements to low income residences reduce energy costs for recipients, providing an economic benefit to limited low income families, to limited income families and their communities. And the program provides important goal benefits to disadvantaged communities such as improved air quality and opportunities for workforce development in clean energy industry. CSD is committed to reducing poverty by helping low income families meet their home energy needs. And through LIWIP, we are doing just that while contributing to the state's um, efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. So thank you for uh, providing the opportunity to speak to you today and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Let's go ahead and move on. Excellent. Uh, good morning, and thank you again for uh, allowing me the opportunity to present uh, Chair Salas, Chair Stone, and, and other members. Again, my name is Randall Winston with the Strategic Growth Council. I'm just going to touch briefly on, on four elements here. One, a bit of background on the Strategic Growth Council. Uh, second, the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program, which is part of the state's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund and specifically benefits to dis disadvantaged communities. Alongside that, uh, a recently funded pilot program providing technical assistance to disadvantaged communities applying to the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program. Uh, and then finally, some specific projects uh, funded in 2014, 2015, uh, as well as some work underway uh, in our next funding round uh, this, this year. So the Strategic Growth Council consists of six agency secretaries uh, and three public members, one appointed by the governor, one appointed by the uh, speaker, as well as the pro tem, and then we are chaired by the uh, director of the governor's office of planning and research. Um, uh, we were founded in, in 2008 and have a relatively broad uh, sort of task here with coordinating activities of state agencies to improve air and water quality, protect natural resources and agricultural lands, increase the availability of, for of affordable housing, promote public health, improve transportation, encourage greater infill and compact development, revitalize community and urban centers, and assist the state and local ent entities, of course, in planning and reaching our sustainable communities goals related to AB 32. Um, for uh, the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program, again, otherwise known as AHSC, it has two components. Uh, one is the, the known as the AHSC program, which uh, funds uh, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions through, through the reduction of vehicle miles traveled, uh, funding land use, housing, transportation, and agricultural land preservation practices that support infill and, and compact development. The other component is the uh, sustainable agricultural 
land uh, and conservation program, uh, which focuses on uh, agricultural protection, easements, mm -hmm. and other strategies and outcomes to protect lands at risk of, of, of conversion. Um, at least 50% of the funds uh, must benefit disadvantaged communities, uh, as in a divide by Cal and Viro screen, and that's our, our overall sort of screen there. Um, I know there's a question earlier about low income versus, versus disadvantaged communities. Uh, last year's budget appropriated $130 million for the AHSC program. This would be for the 2014 2015 round, and we have a continuous appropriation uh, pursuant to SB 862, uh, again, through the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Um, in this past year, just some quick highlights, uh, over 70% of the funds that were awarded did benefit disadvantaged communities. These are projects located in Chula Vista, Santa Ana, Riverside, Long Beach, Los Angeles, Bakersfield, Hanford, Fresno, Stockton, uh, Oakland, Richmond, Emeryville, uh, San Francisco, and West Sacramento, over 2,000 units of, uh, of affordable housing near transit. In addition to reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, benefit includes uh, reducing house housing, transportation, and energy costs, bringing jobs and housing closer together, creating jobs, improving health by reducing air pollutants, and increasing access to parks and, and green spaces. Um, also in this last year, I just want to be clear that we definitely recognize that uh, there is a need to better prepare our disadvantaged communities uh, to maximize greenhouse gas reductions and other co-benefits. Uh, and last year's budget uh, 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 was approved $500,000 for a, a small technical assistance pilot program for disadvantaged communities specifically applying to uh, AHSC. And these are uh, targeted towards 68 applicants who applied last year disadvantaged communities who were unsuccessful. Uh, the, uh, the program works uh, such that there are um, contracts awarded regionally to third party providers to fund uh, or to help provide project proposal development, uh, applica application completion, uh, uh, capacity building, and importantly, evaluation. Uh, we want to uh, learn and see what works best, best with regard to providing assistance and uh, uh, ensuring success. Um, finally, here I wanted to mention uh, just a, a, a few specific projects that, that uh, illustrate the, the, our types of funded uh, activities. Um, first, a, a van pool expansion project, which serves farm workers in rural areas uh, throughout Salinas Valley. Um, uh, San Joaquin and Imperial Valleys as well. These were $3 million to expand a successful program by adding 80 uh, vans to, uh, uh, to the fleet, provide additional shelter and cooling stations for farm workers, and outreach to expand uh, ridership. Uh, the aim here is to reduce transportation costs for farm workers, improve air quality, and of course reduce uh, via my vehicle miles traveled and, and, and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Second, a project we funded in Riverside, the March Veterans Village. Uh, this was a partnership between the U.S. Veterans Initiative, Coachella Valley Housing Coalition, and the March Joint Powers Authority to develop a permanent facility for the, for the U.S. Veterans Initiative program at March Air Force Base. Six million dollars uh, awarded for 138 units of affordable housing for veterans. Uh, this will achieve LEED Silver. It's part of a multi-phased project uh, that will eventually serve 400 uh, residents. And supportive services include the provision of a free transit passes pass to residents, uh, increased job readiness and career opportunities, and of course, uh, once again, the reduction in um, housing, transportation costs, and vehicle miles traveled. Um, finally, just one other project that I'll highlight quickly here, um, Camino 23 in Oakland uh, provided $3 million uh, to tra a transit-oriented development project, including 38 units of permanently affordable as well as affordable housing as well as transportation improvement projects. Uh, this is served by the bus rap rapid transit system in the area and will connect uh, disadvantaged communities in southeast Oakland with employment centers in San Leandro and uh, downtown Oakland. Uh, similarly, as, as some of the other projects, this incentivizes the use of transit by providing passes to residents and adding streetscape improvements um, uh, uh, to create walkable co connections between between transit stops. Um, while we're excited by the 
uh, by, by the first round. Um, we recognize that the, the, the program will continue to improve. It will be an iterative process. The round, those rounds of awards were made in July of 2015, immediately after we held workshops uh, up and down the state to revise our guidelines, uh, responding to some of the, the, the comments that we heard, including those from uh, disadvantaged communities. Uh, uh, some of the key elements or changes that were made to the guidelines, one, we created a new project type uh, focusing 10% of the funds to rural communities um, and why not all disadvantaged communities we recognize that those communities in particular are often uh, 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 most impacted um, and so we're excited to see that roll forward we are holding workshops in the work uh, throughout the state now we just had workshops in Riverside and Los Angeles yesterday mm -hmm. I'll be in Visalia uh, tomorrow um, so again getting the word out and coupling that with our technical assistance efforts to better outreach and provide education to communities uh, to be successful in this next round, hopefully. So happy to answer any questions, and thank you again. Yeah, no, thank you, and especially the technical assistance part of that. <laughs> Mr. Uh, hi. Good, good morning, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for allowing me to uh, testify today. Um, Valerie Terrell of Lajos. I'm a manager of state government relations at PG&E. Um, and um, I know that uh, we want to stay on the, uh, the hearing topic um, and get to the uh, cap-and-trade related um, low-income programs, but I would be remiss um, if I didn't um, just give a little bit of context of the big picture. Um, um, before I before I uh, address the uh, the recently enacted um, multifamily solar program, um, you all are very probably very familiar with some of these programs um, that offer um, income assistance um, on rates mm -hmm. to, um, based on. Um, based on the eligibility on income. Um, and then the uh, Energy Savings Assistance Program is energy efficiency, and it's a weatherization program very similar to um, what is happening at CSD. So you can imagine that um, we talk all the time and coordinate um, closely on those efforts, um, so to use uh, the funds wisely. Um, and a little bit um, you heard about um, an acronym, SASH, um, and then there's uh, the Multifamily Affordable Solar Homes, MASH. Those programs came about under the CSI program. Um, they were, the funding was extended um, and under a Bradford bill, I think in 2013. Um, unfortunately, in, in pg and &E service territory, the, uh, the MASH program is, is suspended. The, the money's out um, in our service territory. Um, and then under SB 43, the Green um, Tariff Shared Renewables Program and Enhanced Community Renewables, there is a set aside where um, a certain number of megawatts, 20%, I believe, will be um, procured or, or located um, in disadvantaged communities. Um, and um, it's the same uh, definition that was spoke about um, earlier using Cal Enviro screen. Um, Mr. Ayala, moving on to cap and trade, uh -huh. uh, Mr. Ayala gave a great explanation of what happens in the utility world with allowances, um, which we have to consign um, to the auctions. That creates a revenue, and um, that's a very important cost containment mechanism to mitigate costs and ease the transition for the utility customer to the low carbon economy. So the legislate this is um, under the purview, of course, of our regulator, the PUC. The, um, under the electric program, the legislature has um, um, said um, under SB 1018, the customers that benefit um, are the very large customers, mm -hmm. small businesses, and then of course we um, are familiar with the climate credit. So, um, and the low income customers are um, eligible for that. And then similarly, there is a um, not a biannual, but an annual climate credit under the natural gas program that um, low income customers um, will receive. The first one going out this April. So that brings me to um, the main topic, mm -hmm. which is um, SB um, uh, 693 uh, was just enacted, became in effect January 1. It is very early in this program, but it establishes a target of um, 300 megawatts um, by 2030 um, with um, all of the implementation phase um, needing to be completed at the PUC by June 30th of 2017. Um, we estimate that pg es share of that based on our a 40% share would be 120 um, megawatts. Um, again, the disadvantaged communities um, 
Cal Enviro Screen, those top 25% communities um, is the focus. And the funding is $100 million or about 10%, whichever is greater, um, of the available funds from these, this IOU cap and trade revenue source um, mm -hmm. under the jurisdiction and um, oversight of the of the PUC. So um, the vision was to create an incentive program to fund solar installation for uh, low income multifamily housing properties. Um, but there there are um, actually two levels of qualification besides the Cal Enviro screen. Uh, imagine you might live in San Francisco where you're not under Cal Enviro screen. Um, and um, if 80% of the households within that five unit, multifamily unit, um, had an income at or below 60% of the area median income, you would also qualify. So as I said, you know, the program is in the very early phases mm -hmm. um, of the PUC determining how to implement it, um, but that is happening um, right now. So um, I think there's a lot of pieces that aren't um, decided yet, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I think it's um, especially with some of the f other funding being finite, um, there is uh, this other train moving. Got it. And that's all under SB 693? Uh, AB. Oh, AB. Eggman, sorry, AB. yes. 693. <laughs> AB 693. I'm sorry, I don't know if there was a typo oh. in, okay. the, in the bill. Okay, thank, well, thank you. you. Thank you guys for your testimony. Uh, I just have a couple questions. I don't want to keep everybody too long. I know we're going along as it is, but maybe if we just start uh, with uh, Mr. Wembley, right? You had talked about the weatherization program. I'm a big fan of the weatherization program. I've seen it implemented in my district and actually gone out and visited some of the uh, training centers that train people mm -hmm. to go and uh, do some of these programs. But uh, if you could just tell me what's been done to date, how many households have we covered? I mean, is it throughout the entire state? I would imagine so, but are we looking at... Are we using Cal and Bioscreen to focus on those areas first and expanding, or is this kind of being done just everywhere simultaneously? Yes, I can. Um, good question. So, um, so first, um, the, the Cal and Bioscreen uh, defines the geographic areas that we're working within, mm -hmm. and so the weatherization dollars have been allocated to all counties that have a, DA, uh, a census tract that falls within the, the Cal and Bioscreen Screen defined disadvantaged community areas. Um, to date, well, as of uh, through November 2015, we weatherized uh, approximately um, 1,500 households, um, and that's based on the first f about three to four months of uh, program implementation. So the program is going to continue. Uh, we anticipate that there should be a significant uh, number of additional projects that we will weatherize over the next calendar year. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's um, basically our, our accomplishments uh, thus far. Got it. And, and all of those activities are within all of the various counties that we've provided funding to. And your participation rates in these programs, I mean, are people, do you have waiting lists? Or are you looking for folks? I would imagine... This is a program that everybody would want to be a part of, especially when we're talking about low and moderate income families. <clears throat> um, you know, some of our agencies have reported they have waiting lists, um, um, but um, you know, there's because of the focus on the disadvantaged communities, um, um, a number of our uh, local service providers have had to implement different uh, outreach strategies to target those specific community areas, mm -hmm. where in the past, under our federal grants, they target the, the entire county area. And so different counties have different um, compositions of census tracts that are within it. Um, so there's that element in terms of outreaching the program. but. Uh, but by and large, you know, there's definitely interest in the program, and there's a need for for these services. Got it. So, just reminds me of another question because we're talking about weatherization. Probably all three of you can answer it. But what's the? How many people are participating in the rooftop solar? I know we we talked about the single units, but also the multifamily. How is uh, that participation rate going? Because I know when I'm at my town halls and community coffees that I do in my different districts. People know that rooftop solar exists, but they never know really exactly how to access it. And if they do access it, what does that really mean to to their bottom line, to their bill? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I could take that. Um, so 
To date, we've uh, we've solarized approximately 584 single-family dwellings. Uh, again, all within various uh, disadvantaged community areas and regions. Um, um, the systems that we install, on average, are about a 3kW system, mm -hmm. and they're sized to to offset about 60, anywhere between 60 to 80 percent of the household's energy usage. So you can see that there's probably going to be a significant offset um, to the to the homeowners in mm -hmm. terms of um, bill reduction and um, and also the the greenhouse gas uh, reductions that are uh, come from those projects. Um, so it's for the first appropriation of dollars, are we projecting to uh, solarize approximately 1,800 homes uh, in disadvantaged communities? And and again, we've um, we've installed solar on four and about 584 homes since uh, November. 